So let's return to our model of soil, because what I'd like to look at now is a little bit further at this uh, pore space phase, and particularly at the water part of that. So again, as I mentioned, the um, amount of organic matter in the, the uh, solid phase is going to vary as a function of a lot of different factors. And the relative amount of pore space versus solid is going to vary as a function of the uh, texture, with the clay textured soils having more than sand. And now it, in the pore space um, part of this, the relative balance of air and water is going to depend, as you might guess, on sort of the, uh, the water input uh, patterns. So, take this off. As you can imagine, so I'll we'll look at this. We have fairly, fairly dry. Uh, so, but, and it can go to this to be fairly wet. All right. So you can imagine that the um, uh, relative amount of water in the pore space has now increased a lot in a condition like this, where you have basically uh, saturated soil after a fairly heavy rain event or irrigation or whatever it may be. So the way that's lo often looked at is, take this off again, um, from a plant perspective really, right, because most of the time people are concerned about the, the level of soil water and how that's affecting plant growth. And there are uh, a series of phases of water levels, so beginning at the, sorry, beginning at the wettest level down here at the, uh, at the end, the um, saturated level. So that would be those ponds of water we saw back in the, uh, the last slide. And as soils begin to dry out, they go progressively through less and less water. So under saturation, water is just sort of dripping through the soil under, under the forces of gravity, so just bringing it downwards. At some point, the, uh, the water that's free in soil can, that can move by gravity is gone. And now there's still water left. This is called field capacity. Uh, what the soils will hold basically by what's clinging to the particles. And as time goes on, if there's no f further water inputs, uh, the soil continues to dry out. Uh, there's still water in here, they're not showing it here, but the films just become uh, thinner and thinner. Right? And so uh, here this is called field capacity, where it's, it's really kind of a nice balance between um, saturated soils here, because uh, if you have a saturated soil, it's all water. That means no air, right? No air means no oxygen, and you need oxygen for plant growth as well as lots of other things. So this is not optimal uh, because too much water can be bad. Too little can be bad because now it's become too dry and wilting point is something um, pretty well self-explanatory. Plants will wilt and, and die. Uh, so this middle part here is sort of the happy median, um, the so-called field capacity. So the way this can be imagined, at least the way soil physicists uh, would look at this, is if you uh, would put this on a scale of here's the, uh, here's the soil particles themselves, the matrix, and the water sort of builds out from this. So uh, out here at the saturation level that we were looking at in the last slide, uh, if this is, for example, say the, the pore space here, that when the pore space is totally filled with water, uh, some fraction of this is not affected by uh, traction to the um, uh, to solid surface here. And that's just what's moving freely under gravity, gravitational water. Uh, and so that's what drips out. Uh, but at some point, the attraction of the um, water molecules to the surface becomes um, stronger. And then you start having these forces that are controlling the, um, uh, the water uh, movement in soil, and so it's no longer just dripping, but it's adhering as films into the soil. So here's that sort of happy median um, up bef between field capacity and above um, the wilting point. Uh, but as the, the films become progressively thinner and thinner, the water is held by stronger and stronger forces. And this is where the, uh, let me clear this off for you so you can maybe see a little bit better. Uh, the forces here become, again, let's go back. Forces here become so strong that 
here. Okay, remember this is my uh, early attempts at the uh, screen casting, so <laughs> going to be some uh, glitches here. So the, these uh, points here are really um, energy levels that are holding water too too tightly for for plants to uh, access it. So we see this, right? So that this is all fairly uh, common, and everybody probably recognizes this. You've been a, you've experienced it somehow. So if your plant starts here, where the water saturated, water drains out at some point. We have the fuel capacity. Plants are happy for a while until they become um, soil becomes too dry, and then eventually the water is held at such a point that the plant can't extract it, and it reaches this, this thing a permanent wilting point which means there's no return back to uh, living. It's only on its way to being, to being dead. So I think everybody uh, probably is familiar with this. So you had this experience uh, with plants, perhaps. Uh, if we got to water them, this is what happens. Uh, actually, there's something that's called, there's a term for this. This is called an air dirt. If this were a hanging plant, uh, this is a plant that's been ignored for three weeks or more and becomes dead, air dirt. Uh, that comes from the, uh, the world of sniglets. That's a word that doesn't appear in a dictionary, but should. So uh, this is something I think that we'll, we'll uh, look at, sort of the broader social applications of things in, in soil biology. And if we think about that a little further, just to give you another example of a uh, sniglet, there's one of my favorites, uh, Waftik, a person who always seems to be in the path of the smoke, whether it's grilling. So maybe uh, activity outside of class is, as we go through the course is to think about sniglets that might apply uh, in soil biology. Anyway, back to what we were talking about, looking at uh, soil water. So that's all been from the plant perspective, and that's important because you know the plant growth is really key to everything that goes on in soil. Uh, but what about when we get down to uh, microbes? All right. So the so the plant perspective is going to be different from the microbial uh, perspective because you know the plants are sensing a very large volume of soil through this expanse of roots but what if you're you know a microbe sitting here or here or here and you're not really able to move much through the soil and so whatever happens in the soil environment around you wherever you happen to be is really what you're going to have to to live with so, so the soil water characteristics that we look at from this broad, broad plant perspective maybe aren't quite so um, uh, informative when we think about these things or try to think about them from, like, from a microbial perspective. So returning to our model of soil here. Uh, we're again kind of thinking about that we're a, a microbe somewhere living within this uh, this matrix and so how does the, the variation of soil water go, uh, affect you if you're a microbe perhaps living here or living here or living here and recall that there is this balance between the um, of the air space and the, uh, the water filled space. So Microbes are going to need, need both for activity, but one thing that this balance is going to, to affect is that there may be pockets within this soil volume that become um, devoid of oxygen, depending on things like how far they are from the outside, so oxygen can move back in, and how high the, the activity may be within some, some point within the soil. So this is that, our model of soil here again, and here is the sort of a computer projection of what oxygen levels may be depending on uh, how well these things are, are connected to the outer uh, surface. And they go from um, uh, fairly high uh, levels of, of oxygen to things that are anoxic low. So you found these two things here, so zero oxygen and anoxic concentrations. And, and the scale here really isn't to explain, but this can, you can imagine this might be uh, micrometers. The um, important thing from this is that in a model like this, you can it can be imagined that you can have 
areas that are fairly uh, high in oxygen uh, here, uh, very close to things that might be very low in oxygen. So this could be, again, just micrometers or less in distance. So one thing that we'll see in, in soil that's possible to have both uh, conditions where, the, where organisms are living with oxygen, um, aerobic conditions, uh, as well as anaerobic conditions happening simult simultaneously. Uh, and that's probably because of this uh, kind of structural um, aspect of soil and, and the potential to develop pockets of, of aerobic versus anaerobic activity. The other thing that's important about the um, sort of the local aspect of the uh, soil water characteristics is the water film thickness. So we saw back on that scale that the water film thickness is going to be uh, decreasing as the soil water dries out and that's affecting the energy that plants must have used to, to extract water. But if you're a microbe and you're not moving around and you basically just have to deal with the water conditions that are uh, in your vicinity, what's happening is that uh, the films are, are probably fairly thin to begin with. So in this um, diagram, what uh, we're looking at is uh, <clears throat> a few different studies where they uh, have measured water in, a, and in soil and tried to calculate the water film uh, thickness across particles. And we have two points here. Here is the field capacity and here's the, the permanent wilting point. This scale is given in bars in suction before we were looking at it in terms of um, a, a unit called um, kilopascals. Uh, and this is really kind of the scientific unit bars is no longer really um, used in scientific literature. But in any case, these are the points that we're looking at, the field capacity point here and the uh, permanent wilting point here. And here's the, uh, the water film thickness. This is in uh, micrometers. So out here at the field capacity level, really kind of the, you know, the wetter kind of range, uh, the film thickness is something on the order of, of a micrometer, right? So that's, if you think about a microbial cell, and we'll, we'll talk more about these, that the cells may be about a, a, a micrometer or so in, in, in length, and maybe a half a micrometer uh, in, um, in diameter. So a, a micrometer thick water film would just perhaps, you know, uh, if this is half a micron uh, thickness, you have you know, another half a micron uh, of water film above it. So this would be in water, but you know, not a huge amount of water. So it's not floating around freely in a big bathtub, for example. But that's the, the, the wetter of the conditions out here at the, the um, field capacity. And as this dries down, these films are becoming thinner and thinner. So you pretty quickly get down to water film thicknesses that become fractions of the of the thickness of the cells. So this really is a, a different view of, of microbes in soil, that they aren't just floating around freely in, in water, but their, their movement and also potentially their communication between microbes is, is restricted by these fairly thin uh, water films. Okay, just a couple of final thoughts before we uh, leave this section. I'd just like to go back to uh, what we were, uh, a figure we were looking at a bit earlier. So you recall this diagram we were looking at. This is a microscopic view of, of a soil slice. And what this uh, study was examining was the distribution of bacteria in soil. And if you remember what, this, what we were learning from this is that the um, microbial, the bacterial uh, communities or the, the microbes making up the bacterial community are, are pretty much dispersed uh, throughout the soil in these small little pockets. So you can, again, it's hard to tell at, at scales like this what actually might be a cell or not, but uh, in any case you may have little things like this that are, that are around uh, throughout the soil. So what I'd like to do then is tie this idea into what we were just talking about with the, uh, the soil water distribution. So how might the this kind of distribution of, of bacterial cells in soil, might, how might that be affected by the distribution of the water? And let's kind of take another, another view of this. So if we're looking at this sort of a, from a cartoon view right now, 
And what we were uh, looking at in the last slide, for example, would have been these little colonies of bacteria like here and here. Uh, these things are kind of isolated in a, in a sense. We don't know from that last view if there was any kind of pore space here connecting those things. You know, it could just as well be a, a solid here. Uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't know that. But uh, in any case, uh, let's let's just think about this uh, right now. That this is sort of the, the situation where we have uh, these two these two groups of organisms. This one over here and this one over here that are living in these kind of um, pockets of water that are collected around the, uh, the corners of particles. So these little pockets of water would be important for supplying nutrients, presumably, to these, to these different uh, bacteria. So they could, could be living off of things that are, that are local right here. Uh, the, um, any other kind of interaction between these two uh, groups of, of organisms is going to require this process of, of diffusion. Uh, so any, any chemicals that are going to be um, moving through the soil uh, would have to move through these, through these films uh, by this process of diffusion. So diffusion is going to be important in controlling or affecting how microbes gain access to nutrients because they could have nutrients that are here in their little pocket but they may, may, these may run out and they'll rely on diffusion to, to acquire these. Or if they're going to interact with, with two different, or, uh, with a different group of organisms, that would probably have to occur through diffusion as well. Because the microbes are not, you know, as we were learning, not just laying on top of each other. Okay, so, so that's gonna be a concept that's go that we're going to or return to because later on we'll talk about uh, microbial diversity in soil and one thing that's going to be some, uh, something we'll talk about is just a very high diversity of bacteria in soil. It's probably has the highest diversity of bacteria in any kind of environment that we'll see. And the question is, well, why is that? What, what is it about soil that can support such high um, diversity of, of bacteria in, in particular? And <clears throat> one of the theories, or perhaps a, a key theory, is that the structured environment of soil, so that, that porous network that we're talking about, uh, can effectively separate uh, organisms so that they're not directly competing with, with each other. So if we were to go back to our, 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 um, our last slide, if I can do that, I can't, let's see. Oh. Well, let's forget that right now. But if you remember our, our little, uh, our bacteria were located in these little pockets so we have one over here, one over here, and then there was some distance between these two. Um, this is sort of uh, reflected in this environment. So we're look, comparing two different kinds of environments uh, here. One is heterogeneous, which could be something like this with our soil that has structure that separates um, organisms versus something that's homogeneous. And that could be something like, like water, for example, lake water, where things are moving around freely. And this is basically a computer model where uh, these two different species, the species one is the blue and species two is the um, orange one, but I guess it's kind of yellow up here, uh, that these are put into these two different environments and then the simulation is allowed to run for, uh, in this case, 600 hours, so beginning at hour 200 here and ending at, at hour 800 out here. And then given whatever you know, model parameters are put in here, um, the species are allowed to interact or not. So in this case, species one, um, must be programmed somehow to be a stronger competitor than species uh, species two, because in the homogeneous environment after this time frame, species two is pretty much eliminated. Uh, I guess the presumably the idea is that the stronger competition of this species for whatever the limiting nutrient is here basically leads to the um, disappearance of that species. So this becomes a relatively, uh, this is a loss of diversity in the system as this guy goes away. Uh, but when there's some sort of structure involved, as in the case of this heterogeneous system, which could be like soil, uh, there's some loss. So for example, like this little bit here is gone, but the other ones seem to persist. These guys have, have proliferated. But there's still some persistence of the, of the weaker competitor. So here's the species two. So this is one idea about why 
the structure of soil may allow things to coexist which might not coexist in, in other circumstances. You can imagine this, for example, being, you know, example uh, like uh, a zoo, where you're the zookeeper, and you've got the tigers and the zebras together, and, and you decide, well, I'm going to, you know, put them all in one pen. Uh, that would be this example here. Uh, you come back over the weekend, and guess what? <laughs> no more zebras. Uh, but, you know, if you put them into some kind of a, an environment where the zebras are allowed to, to move freely or there's some sort of um, uh, habitat where they can hide in, then the, the, the zebras, in this case, the species too, can, can live and you can maintain the diversity. So, uh, again, this is something we're going we're gonna to come back to in the future, but I'd just like to, to bring this idea up now so you'll have this in the back of your mind when we, um, we see this later on.